Um, so, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Briggs, who's going to uh, start out with us today. Steve is the uh, person who is getting the Plant Science Initiative rolling. So he started from scratch coming here. Uh, Steve has a very interesting background. Of course, he's, he's brilliant because he's an entomologist. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So Steve started his career at University of Illinois in extension entomology. So he knows all about this stuff. He's moved through all sorts of jobs. He couldn't stay in one place. Couldn't keep a right? job. Right. Couldn't keep a job. He worked, I think, the BASF? Yeah. The BASF. But he also worked for the wheat growers of South Dakota. South Dakota like a $3 billion kind of enterprise. And I mean, he was in charge of all of these kind of things from marketing to just getting better wheat and all that. So he was, that was your, the job for this. So um, he's taken on a big responsibility and it's been actually interesting to watch him over the last year, year and a half, starting from zero and building this thing up to uh, now when, when things are really starting to roll out and there are a lot of opportunities. But I would say that when we were writing the grant proposal for the NRT, I went and met which, with um, Steve Lommel and Steve Briggs about the NRT, about what we were doing, coming begging to them for support, and they just turned around on a dime and gave us these two additional fellowships per year for the uh, NRT, which is really was instrumental, those kinds of things in us getting this grant. Um, and I think that's because Steve and Steve see the connection between what we're trying to do and, and the uh, Plant Science Initiative. So uh, Steve's going to talk for about a half hour about this Plant Science Initiative, and then we'll open it up to questions, especially about our interfacing between the two groups. Thank you, Fred, and, and I'm humbled and honored to be here today. I've, I've attended three or four of these uh, uh, when I can, my schedule allows. I, I just uh, enjoy the, uh, the presentations, number one, but also the, the uh, interdisciplinary group. You'll hear me say that word more than once today that's assembled here, and you're, uh, you're wishing to get better in different areas, and you'll hear me talk about that today. Also a big supporter of uh, what GES is, and I have my last slide, talks about your pillars and kind of the alignment with the Plant Science Initiative. And I'm just excited uh, to, to kind of talk to you today a little bit about the initiative, but I want to focus on the people piece. And unlike most of my presentations, uh, everybody wants to know about the building, and I do have two or three slides about the building that will come. Everybody likes to talk about that. But I remind people, number one, uh, it's about the science. The Plant Sciences Initiative will not be successful if science is not done, produced, refined, gotten better, etc. And to do the science, it takes great people. And we have great people at this university. You all work with them every day. I get to work with them every day. And I am probably more energized uh, at night than I am in the morning when I get here after talking to dis different people, different colleges, uh, different people that I would never in my own uh, fashion, kind of seek out and, and get uh, instruction or, or discussion with. So it's been a fascinating year and a half as I've been here. Excited to lead this initiative as Joe and I were talking before you all arrived. This initiative is bigger than any one individual. And this initiative is really bigger than any one college or university. But collectively, between our college, our university, our partnerships with other people in our state, in our country, and around the world, this will be uh, the best place for plant science research to be done in the world for generations to come. And that excites me because uh, it's, it's something that I will leave behind, uh, hopefully in better shape than when I arrived, and something that uh, will kind of be a legacy for this university for a long time to come. And as I've got uh, a few grandchildren now that are kind of growing up, who knows, uh, I think I see a couple of scientific minds in some of them. A couple of them I don't, but a couple of them do. Uh, and, uh, and it's exciting to maybe think they'll, they'll work in this plant science building that will ultimately be built on our Centennial campus. So let me start out with our aspiration. I've kind of mentioned that is to be the best, to be the best leading a research and educational plant science program in the world. Uh, a lofty aspiration, but uh, I've learned in my 30 years, uh, primarily with industry, uh, set your goals high and aim for the highest goal you can achieve. So let's start out with the building. I usually end on 
accountability, but I want to get these slides out of the way and focus on the people aspect, the training aspect of this later. But this is the, uh, the latest rendition. I will say it's the last rendition you will see before uh, uh, you'll actually start to see a building because this is the one that I tell people the plans are going from pencil to ink, meaning once they get to be ink, you don't make many changes. So this is uh, the look of the, uh, the building as it appears now in the plans that uh, we're the architects are working feverishly to get uh, the, the plans done. It'll be uh, one of those iconic buildings, a building that people want to come to, walk into, touch, feel, ask questions about what's going on in the building. It, uh, it'll be fan absolutely fantastic. You see here uh, the, uh, the landscape out front. Everything uh, you'll see here has kind of been done by design. With the landscape, we'll have a message to tell. You see these little blocks here of, uh, of uh, what we call little demonstration plots, and maybe there'll be some some cultivar varieties, hybrids that have been developed here at NC State, either in the building, work going on in the building, or research stations, whatever, that we can demonstrate to the public. Maybe the turf is a brand new a variety of turf. Uh, maybe some of the flowers or the plantings represent some of the research being done here. So uh, this is a, will be a fantastic place for what I'll call show and tell the public. The, uh, the lawn here, a little less than a half acre, can be set up. You can put a tent here. It'll be, uh, have underground wires. You can put a PA system. Uh, so you can have graduation events, social events. The first floor here is the only public floor in the building, but it'll be fantastic. A lot of glass. Uh, on the left side of the building will be a 135-seat auditorium, uh, state-of-the-art audiovisual, uh, it can be subdivided into three separate sections of 45 uh, that you can hold concurrent sessions in. Uh, seminars, public seminars, receptions, uh, a lot of big events here. It has a catering kitchen in the back. The rest of the first floor is uh, still what I'll call under development, but I guarantee you there'll be a donor wall so, if, uh, we can, so that we can recognize our donors to the, the building. It'll have probably some historical component of the North Carolina agriculture on that first floor. It'll also have some, uh, and you'll see this throughout the building, a lot of open collaborative coffee kind of areas, bump and you know, water cool areas where two or three of you can sit and chat, have a cup of coffee, cup of tea, chat about things. Uh, you'll see that throughout the building. And then on the right hand side of the building, which is the front door of the building, uh, will be the, kind of the executive offices and the staff permanent offices. Yes, question. Have you guys reached out to the history department, for example, to help you design that sort of historical? Well, yeah, and I, I would say not yet, but we are. Uh, history, art, design, uh, humanities have all been engaged, and we have yet to kind of fine tune what that looks. We've got some preliminary ideas, but we need to get that. It's a great suggestion, and we will. We had they were on our list. Matthew Booker, uh, who's a player of the GDS, teaches uh, history of North Carolina agriculture. Okay. Actually, revived that class after it was dormant for a very long time. And that he might be a great. Touch. I will reach out. Just another view of the building. Uh, one of the unique things about the building is the greenhouse uh, will be on top of the building. Uh, it's a five-floor, five-story building with the greenhouse occupying the fifth floor. Architecturally uh, challenging to put a greenhouse on top of the building when you think about what greenhouses are: light and water. Uh, and you have to be careful that water doesn't kind of go where water wants to go uh, uh, when, when you have things. So uh, uh, a little more expensive to put it here, but it was really our only way to guarantee on Centennial, ten, Centennial Campus that uh, we don't have any shading aspect. Uh, experiments can go awry if uh, you expect daylight and all of a sudden you have shade. So uh, we, we've got that. The, the building will be at the highest point on Centennial Campus. This represents Oval Drive here on this side. Uh, so you'll come down this way to that Oval Engineering Oval, where the engineering buildings are. On the back side is the parking deck on Partners Way. And there'll be a little uh, cut road uh, kind of right in here that separates, separates BTEC from our building here. Uh, just an iconic, great looking building. I'm excited about that. You know, Hunt Library has its feature. I mean, everybody wants to go into Hunt. This will be equally um, impressive. I will say, just uh, to fill in the blank, around the building here is kind of undeveloped land. There's 32 acres yet to be developed. And as you uh, talk to the university officials, uh, this will be a mixed use area of Centennial Campus. They'll have other academic buildings, but they'll have retail, including restaurants and maybe bars, and there'll be housing in this area. So 
there'll be a lot of activity somewhere down the road around the plant sciences building, which if you think about, and one of my hats I wear, I've told Joe, is fundraising. When you think about people wanting to get their name or their logo in front of people, to have this in a neighborhood kind of setting is really important and uh, hopefully will we'll generate some additional fundraising opportunities for people. Inside view, this is that first floor, that seminar room I mentioned that seats 135 people. This is kind of what it would look like. There's about six stairs down into this area, so you're kind of on those stairs. But you can see the great views of Centennial Campus, a lot of glass. Uh, to the right is that seminar room there that you can enter into the doors. Just a lot of great public areas to, to sit and mingle and talk to. Uh, if you go upstairs, uh, the, the building is built in an open fashion. No longer will each individual researcher or research program have their own lab that's in cinder blocks with uh, one door with a small window and no other windows in our lab. Uh, we've kind of done away with that. We've got a lot of glass, a lot of open areas. Uh, you see some movable research benches here that can be accommodated to fit other what the research is doing. And maybe some year, uh, maybe wet benches aren't even needed. They're computational kind of stations as, as we research goes that way. But you see a lot of this open, uh, open air, open office kind of setting uh, for, again, to promote that collaboration uh, effect here. Any good business, any good operation runs from the mission statement, and we put this one together, and I've kind of highlighted some of the keywords here that I want to stress a little bit later. But uh, the Mission to Plant Science Initiative is to really accelerate. I want to pause there because we have great research going on today. Historically, NC State's been great for many years, decades. But as you know, in science, things are faster and faster. We're producing more data, more data, more research results are coming quicker and quicker, and society is really demanding that we kind of pick up the pace if we're going to meet that grand challenge of feeding a bunch more people in 2050 than we have here today. So the acceleration piece of this is important as we put the PSI together in terms of the discovery, the educational piece, which I include the student piece of this, innovation and outreach. And so we'll do this by working together interdisciplinarily, and I'll talk about that. And uh, the great news is this building has already got a lot of uh, partnerships, a lot of stakeholders involved. Uh, we live in a great state for agriculture. It's our number one industry, $87 billion, uh, and a lot of uh, people pay attention to agriculture in our state. In my career, I've lived in uh, 13 different locations, many states, and those 13. And I will tell you, in a lot of those states, agriculture is not even on the top 10 in terms of the importance of that state's economy. Not so in North Carolina. And we're blessed by that because uh, we have a lot of uh, people that can uh, pay attention to it and give us uh, the focus that we need. Core goals here. Uh, we heard me talk about partnership-driven efforts. We're grateful. So far, the building has uh, people from 44 different commodity associations in our state have written checks to support the building of this building, 44. Uh, that's, that's pretty darn good when uh, associations have written checks and have that. I will also tell you that's the good news. The bad news is all 44 of those people are going to want something out of the building, right? So you're going to have to please a bunch of masters here, but uh, we'll work on that. Integrate world-class talent and leadership. I firmly believe we have that today, but the best, the best building, the best faculty, the best students, the best facilities, the best equipment will keep and attract the best. It's kind of one of those balls that starts rolling down the hill and picks up momentum. We'll build interdisciplinary teams. I'll talk about that. And I'll spend some time on this next generation student because uh, this is important um, in my eyes and in the university's eyes. And then we will construct that globally renowned uh, science hub. So let's talk about that next generation student. Some of you are in that student uh, mode, some of you are postdocs or whatever, but this is really exciting because uh, the next generation student is something that NC State can do better than a lot of private research companies. You know the Danforth Center in St. Louis, we always get compared as uh, 
as competitors to the Danforth Center. They're doing great science, great research, great plant science uh, out of the Danforth Center. I think NC State does a couple of things that differentiate ourselves from them. Number one, we can take an idea from discovery all the way to implementation, you know, the Think and Do University. So we, we've got great scientists along the pathway of discovery all the way to, to uh, what I'll call IP or new, new, uh, new companies, new products. Can you say something more about yes. the Danforth Center? I don't think yep. Even Dor it. Danforth Center is a private research center in, Dan in uh, St. Louis, Illinois, uh, that has great scientists doing private re research for private companies. Hmm. Turning out great things. But they don't turn out the students. And I don't think they have, I know they don't have the breadth of the field assets that we have here at NC State. You know, we can take an idea from the bench to the greenhouse to the field in a number of our different locations around our state and test that concept and test that product out. So this next generation student is something that we can do very, very well. We've got a visitor in from the VIB. VIB is a Belgium institute that does, again, plant science research, great research. Uh, they turn out students as well, but they don't have the field component that uh, we do here in North Carolina. So we're, we're great in a lot of different areas, inside, outside, and student generation for that uh, to, uh, to fill those jobs that are here and coming. The student coming out of the Plant Science Initiative, the, the postdoc, uh, the graduate student coming out, uh, will have a broad range of uh, knowledge in a lot of related disciplines. When I was a graduate student in entomology, I feel I was pretty well trained in entomology. Not too bad. But I really wasn't forced to think, nor was I forced academically, to kind of leave my building, per se. I think uh, I make the joke that the, the horizontal part of my graduate education was I had to take another class in organic chemistry. You know, not too far of a departure from entomology. But what we're going to ask our students to do, from the Plant Science Initiative training perspective, is to get a broader range, get a broader range of education. Uh, maybe it's finance, maybe it's social sciences, maybe it's history. Uh, outside the, the true science piece of what uh, we went to school to, to get a degree in. Strong communication and interpersonal skills. I cannot stress enough, having worked um, in industry a long time and been around the country, how important this aspect of uh, students getting trained and getting better in communication and interpersonal skills. You can be the brightest scientist in the world, but I guarantee you your, your cap, your ceiling will be limited if you don't practice and hone in on communication and interpersonal skills. This will hold you back in a number of different fronts. And uh, I've seen it in my career. I've seen it as I've mentored people coming through uh, industry. Uh, so I would encourage all of you, uh, be a constant learner, even at my old age, uh, constantly learning to get better. And early in my career, I always uh, enjoyed watching great public speakers and trying to learn what they were doing. Not so much their words, but their antics, their motions, their eye movement. Uh, you, uh, you may get turned off by the, the uh, Sunday morning preaching, but if you want to turn off the message, listen to the message and watch the antics, there's some great public speakers that, that really drive home some great skills there that all of us can learn from. Globally conscious. You know, our world's asking us today those tough questions. Are we growing our food the right way? Is our land and water and resources going to be around for the next generation? Where did my food come from? How can I trace that? So we're living in a world today that's asking those questions of us as scientists, you all as scientists, and trying to figure out where do we go from here? So we want students to be able to engage in those conversations. There's only one way that we can produce more food uh, in 2050 than we do today, and that's through science. And so we're gonna have to communicate those results by knowing the issues that we're confronting <coughs> at the coffee shop, at the, uh, at the bar, at the restaurant, wherever you're hanging out. Understanding of leadership and management methods and practices, key. Uh, again, you can be the greatest scientist doing great science, but I encourage you to learn and, and understand management techniques, how to manage and lead teams, how to create that team environment for success, how to celebrate success. You know, part of my, looking back 30 years of my career, uh, I don't know if we celebrated successes a lot. 
You know, sometimes we did that, okay, nod the head and let's move on kind of thing. Uh, take time, take a breath, celebrate your successes, lead teams to successes. There's no greater feeling uh, than being a leader of a team that succeeds. Goal setting, interdisciplinary team environment, relationship building, all play into that. Uh, ethical decision making, and I applaud your efforts in the GES and, and other uh, areas here. This is uh, quickly becoming uh, something that we need to pay attention to. Society needs to know from a science perspective we're making the right ethical decisions. And then train to think critically and analyze real world problems. All of these next generation things we hope to have accomplished so when we turn out students into the workforce, whether to work in academia, whether to work in industry, government, NGOs, um, that they have touched and we've been, we've been a part of their learning process through our initiative. So just to summarize, professionally trained to solve problems horizontally across discipline lines. So understanding kind of what's over on the other side of the fence, other than just in my playground here. Uh, graduating talents will excel in those soft skills. And Dean Braden from, uh, from CHAS reminded me, sometimes those soft skills are really hard. Okay? And I picked up on that really quick because I didn't have those parentheses when I talked to Dean Braden. But he convinced me, and I know it. Uh, some of those soft skills for certain individuals are hard to learn and hard to understand. So we need to get a grasp of those. Appreciate how society is operating and asking us questions. And this future ready student will be kind of grounded in his or her discipline. You'll be a great plant pathologist, entomologist, uh, soil scientist, uh, microbiologist, but you kind of know the world around you that you're playing in. So I'm excited. Fred mentioned uh, his early discussions with Steve Wommel and, and I about this. Uh, we were his biggest cheerleaders, still are in terms of the progress here. I know you're making great strides on this. But uh, I pulled out of there as I reviewed the documents a couple of the goals, and I may have uh, I took liberties to kind of maybe edit some of these goals. But one of the goals was to train scientists who can work at convergence of technical, social, political, and ethical issues to find biological solutions to solve agriculture's grand challenge. And the second goal I captured in there is this whole student training, to apply your technical knowledge, communicate that to the public, that's effective and sustainable with minimal un unintended consequences. So I took that first goal, and I looked it back at where we are from the Plant Science Initiative and how it aligns, and I think it aligns fantastically. Uh, if we look at the building, and Fred and I have been in a number of these meetings, because as I visit with faculty, they go on, What's it going to take for me to be in that building? Well, the first criteria is this whole uh, thought and uh, process of working interdisciplinarily. That's key. We won't have uh, faculty members working on projects here that are kind of silo projects. They're going to have to be demonstrating or demonstrate that interdisciplinary research. So it lines really well up there at that convergence of, of different ideas and techn technical skills. And secondly, these uh, research pro uh, proposals, I think in my mind, it will be even more heavily weighted if you can include more than one college, more than multiple departments in here. So the more interdisciplinary our, uh, the project is, number one, I think the better the research results will be, because you're going to have different opinions forming the solutions here, and uh, I just think that's a win-win. That's so. Uh, we will be very quickly encouraging faculty to reach out across colleges, ideate around an idea. Um, and, I'll, and if you need my help, I, this is something I really love and I have loved since I've been here, is getting different groups together in a room, throw out a challenge and watch them kind of work around that challenge from their professional aspect. Engineers, working with plant pathologists, working with entomologists on some of the big issues that we can't tackle today. Get some divergent minds in there. The second goal here um, was that uh, the training uh, aspect and uh, the communication aspect to, to the public. And uh, our vision for students coming out of the Plant Science Initiative is we'll, that we'll likely have not one major professor, but maybe coal multiple, uh, coal major professors, more than one. You've got Fred and you've got somebody in CHAS, and you've got Fred and somebody in College of Science kind of working together with you on your research projects. 
I'd love to see our graduates involved with some for, uh, some type of internship, maybe nationally or internationally. Hard to do. I know some of you are at the bench 24-7, seven days a week. You've got research going on. But we've got to find a way to get you exposed to, uh, to internships outside of this university. And we've got a couple of uh, companies that are asking those same questions, multinational companies. A lot of the, uh, the people educated in Germany have and must have a company internship before they can get their PhD or their graduate degree. And they're looking at us going, how do we make that work here? And so John Dole and, and uh, our associate dean and gals is really working on that with some of these companies to, to structure an internship. Now, I'm not talking about a six or eight month internship. I'm probably talking about four, six, eight weeks. Maybe it's four weeks here and four weeks in Australia or four weeks in Germany with that company. Two things. One, you get to learn a little bit about that company's culture. And two, they get to learn a little bit about you. And maybe come graduation time, there's a great marriage there that you would enjoy working in that environment and they would welcome your expertise and leadership there. So hopefully we can get an internship program up and running and, uh, and get them uh, uh, undergoing here because I think it's important part of rounding out the education here. And then class requirements, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll strongly encourage, underline strongly, that you reach outside of this science discipline that you're in. Take a finance class, take a uh, sociology class, take some classes on leadership or management style. Uh, we are in the process of putting together a center here on our campus for regulatory science and agriculture. It will be the first one that I know of in the U.S., maybe in the world. And someday down the road, uh, after the university blesses it and we get everything in place, I can maybe see students coming out, undergraduate students coming out with a degree in regulatory science. Uh, agricultural needs people trained in science that's making these regulatory decisions. So maybe you're taking a couple of classes in there. And John, uh, doing some great work uh, on this internship, and also looking at uh, how we set up maybe an ag analytics degree. Um, working with SAS on this, uh, I think this would be an extraordinary opportunity as, uh, as you know, everything is going and everybody's talking about the big data and data analytics and analyzing data and making data work for you. So this whole knowledge management area is one that uh, agriculture is asking us to get involved with and train our students in this area. So just to summarize, you know, if you look at plant science research, uh, there's so many different aspects of what goes into plant science research. Some of you are involved with some of these, some of you are not. But uh, you see a lot of different topics, and uh, again, society's asking us questions on all of these. And it's no longer do we have the luxury to live in our silo and be an entomologist and be a great entomologist. We kind of have to know kind of the world we're living in here today. You know, ultimately, we, we end up with new things, you know, plant varieties, hybrids, cultivars, ideas, precision ag techniques, ways to look at data, ways data can work for us, electronics, robotics, you name it. Agriculture is moving at warp speed uh, using the new technology that's available to, to everybody. So, a couple of slides left and I'll open up to questions. Uh, just to, again, summarize, uh, mentorship, I think is important here. Continuous interaction, people in the building, or we call these collision areas where people can collide and have lunch, have a cup of coffee have a, a seat and talk about their research together. Uh, internships are important, require coursework outside of, of your, uh, your core study, um, joint curricula across colleges, <laughs> faculty advisors, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to talk about it, but I love to see faculty engaged on the interdisciplinary kind of uh, discussion so that they can bring their students along. A couple of things that are available today that I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, this uh, Ally, the Le Ag Leadership Institute, is one that uh, CALS puts on. It's uh, some training efforts there. Uh, the Graduate School puts this Accelerate to Industry uh, program on. It's an intensive one-week program. I think they may offer it twice a year. I know at least once. But it's an intense uh, week where industry comes in, you form teams, you handle a, a project in a team fashion. And so it kind of gives you those interpersonal team leading skills. 
and then at the end of the week you present back to industry. So it's a it's a great uh, immersion into kind of industry think and solving some problems from an industry perspective. So I encourage you to look into that. And then this Center for Excellence in Regulatory Science and Agriculture, we put an acronym ACERSA. Uh, it will be an exciting thing for NC State. Uh, we have so many people excited about this outside of the university because everybody is looking for people trained in science to handle regulatory affairs, either inside their company or from a government, federal or state regulator perspective. Last slide here, uh, I pulled out these off your website, GES. The engagement piece talks about across college and interdisciplinary scholarships, multidisciplinary activities, true alignment there with a plant science initiative. This communication piece that hopefully I've identified and talked to you how important communication piece is, not only amongst the researchers, but also our outbound uh, communication efforts. Very important here. And this whole analysis in terms of uh, taking data, taking data sets, and making them work for our society today and our future society for tomorrow. So those are my slides, my overview of the Plant Science Initiative. I'm pretty passionate about this. I have several slide decks if you want to learn more about the initiative and make the history or the plant, the building, whatever. I can definitely meet with you one-on-one -on -one and talk to you more about that. But uh, uh, that's what I have. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have on Plant Science Initiative, what you saw today, or maybe something you didn't see. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, can I ask you to go back two slides? Absolutely. So that one of the students just so we can keep that in mind. Yeah, just All right. So, questions, ideas? I, a, I would, I mean, I think it's great that you are, have the word internships on uh -huh. there. I mean, just from a personal experience, in my undergraduate program, we were required to do almost a year's worth of internships. So, and it absolutely changed my career path. Those opportunities to have actual real world experience is, is, is probably why I'm working here now. Um, so I would say encourage you to push for that. As we hard have, as possible. You know, we have undergraduate internships, we just don't have them for the graduates, and I think it's so important, but I appreciate your comments. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to ask was part of the, I guess, the regulatory science piece, and if you guys are thinking about sort of the interactions that this kind of institute is going to have with. Say like international treaties, like the plant treaty, particularly if you're going into the, you know, the data realm. Those are all sort of real world, real time issues that are are springing up. I'm just curious if that's part of your thinking or how you're. You know, I would say our thinking is uh, still our first base. We haven't run at first base yet. Uh, Dr. Denisha Seth Carway, she's a professor at Court, is the director of this. She would welcome any of those comments. I'll pass it on. But if you have an opportunity, you know, Denisha, pass on your thoughts about that. She's trying to structure kind of what this big machine will look like eventually. You know, there's a lot of question: is it just national, is it international? Well, my response is ag is international. You've got to think internationally. And then does it include animals or is it just plants? So it, this thing could get huge really big. And I want to make sure we do things right before, before we expand too big. But uh, all those in, in regulatory policy, I've had the Dean Braden and I have had discussions on their expertise in regulatory policy. Policy's got to be a part of this. So it's it's a big animal uh, that I'm excited that we're on our journey to get there. Right. Jennifer's on the steering committee for that, right? What's that? Jennifer Cooper's yes. on the yep. steering committee. Yep. So that's a good entree. She's, she's a good link to that. Yeah. Yeah, Jennifer was heavily involved early on with that. Yes, sir. So I agree with the internship part. Um, I'm I'm doing a master as part of the master in microbial biotechnology, and we are required to have an internship. But I think that I have learned two things from the process: the internship itself, and also like the search of to work somewhere, having most of your experience in academia or government, and that was a challenging process for me, which I think that got I got a lot of result from it. I learned how to apply. I learned how to deal with rejection from companies. <laughs> At the end of the day, it was really positive for me, and I, I, I'm not sure how much of that would be um, as part of, of a scheme that already assess or, or that already have connections with the industry and the students. And if so, uh, if you're just going to let the students to get their internships by themselves, 
by themselves. Uh, have you? Do you know how the market the market of internship is around the triangle? Because you may just saturate the system if if you're gonna open uh, this as part of our requirement. Yeah, I think uh, uh, my thought is, and, and John he's been working on this quite a lot, uh, is we would hopefully have a mechanism for internships. We'd have a company list of openings and opportunities and help guide the, the communication, the collision between possible intern in the industry. So I, I don't know where John is thinking about that, but uh, we, we would just not throw you into the ocean and ask you to kind of start swimming right immediately. We hopefully give you some guidance there. Zach? You may have already talked about something like this, but uh, for just a point of comparison, so uh, the environmental uh, Masters of Environmental Management program at Duke. Uh, they have a stand back internship program. It's funded by the stand back uh, from the Fred stand back, I think. Um, so they have a donor who, who commits money to help fund them those internships. And if you're building funding, and you're talking about the people, and more than just the building, building funding for an internship program where that would be a, that would be a kind of yeah. a really cool direction. Yeah. Sure. What is funding in that? What is that directed to? Well, so what it allows is it allows students, because the environmental field is comprised more of NGOs and the people who don't necessarily have the money to employ an intern, um, they, the, their internship program pays the interns to work at like EDF and different, uh, different places like that. And so it, in this case, I mean, it would allow, and that kind of leads to another question I was going to ask, which was, you know, you talked a lot about private industry and also academia at the table here, and then growers associations too, but what about other stakeholders in different sectors? environmental sector or not. I mean, if you're talking about the Center for Regulatory Science, if it's just private industry helping fund that center, you know, there'd be, there'd be any concerns yeah, about Yeah, that whole, you know, that whole, those whole, all those segments have to play this together as part of that, uh, you know, developing those partnerships across across barriers. And yeah, uh, I didn't mean to limit to those two or three. Yeah. It, it is a wide field. And I get that a lot when I visit the College of Natural Resources. You know, they have a lot of people in that area as well that are interested in playing in this game. Yes? Um, so I want to back up my Dean's suggestion that the soft skills are really hard. Uh -huh. uh, and one of the reasons that they're hard is that they're often kind of an afterthought. Like you set up the science curriculum and then, mm -hmm. oh, there's By no the communication in there. Let's do a workshop, um, which is not going to be the effective method of really producing the quality graduates that you're uh, talking about. So um, what's your process for involving people in CHAZ um, in, because the courses that you need may, may or may not exist. If they exist, they're not tailored currently to your students, um, and they may not have seats. So is there, are you conceiving a process of? I, I conceive of one. I'm not down that path yet, but yes. Um, in my couple discussions over there, I've met with uh, Aaron Clark, the, the new STEM department head. Uh, he's very interested STEM in STEM education. STEM he's education. in College of he's Education. education. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. So I'm engaged with him as well as in, in CHAS. So we've got to flesh that out. I, I haven't gone down that path yet. But well, um, I'll follow up with an email. Um, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have some suggestions you want to off the right here? Ideas? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm part of the public science, leadership in public science cluster. Uh -huh. We're very interested in developing science communication curriculum. Perfect. Um, but we're under-resourced and understaffed, so we'd love to have a, ch a chance to talk with you about um, we could help develop the curriculum, yep. and um, you could help us help get fun. students and yep. make good. the, make the guess, That sounds perfect. That's exciting, really. Great. Yes, sir. Um, I'm interested in the environmental science program. Uh, I'm curious about the professor experience, where you talk about professors proposing interdisciplinary projects that then get housed in the center. Um, from the practical side, what's that going to look like? So if you're a professor who has a research group or a lab somewhere in their department, are they sending half their lab and into this building for a few years? I, I see, I can foresee there being a, a downside to that approach. Yep, and you asked the question that every faculty member I visit with talks about. <laughs> so you're, you're not off track there. The way we envision this is uh, uh, individuals won't go into this uh, building, it'll be projects. So if your professor's got two or three projects uh, and you already have a home department, 
and you win a new grant or you have a project you want to put in the building interdisciplinary, we, we would, you know, if, you, if selected, you would go into that building. And uh, you as a professor uh, running that would probably keep your home department so you have those communications, you have your other students there. And you would probably visit the building uh, once a week, once every other week. But your graduate student, your postdoc running that project would be housed in that building for that project duration. So that's a big part of that governance that we're still working through. Fred has been on that committee with me uh, because that's the, we, you know, projects and space are two questions I get from faculty all over campus. And we're still working on that. But uh, we envision this to be a project by project selection to go into the building, interdisciplinary. And we're, uh, we don't uh, anticipate a lot of professors picking up their entire office and moving and residing in that building uh, in, in, as, a, as a whole. So is, is there a model for that elsewhere that you're working off of, like some other university? There is. Uh, we have Purdue, uh, it's very successful, 15 years at Purdue. We had some of their faculty members in a month or so ago, three weeks or so ago, uh, talking about how that worked or didn't work. Uh, Stanford University, uh, I visited there uh, earlier this year. Uh, very similar concept, interdisciplinary studies. This is on the medical field, not the plant science field. Uh, but they had the same issue about professors moving out of their home departments. And so there are uh, some models, and we're trying to pick what's worked for both of those universities and try to model maybe some of our governance around that. I want to piggyback off that, but more from the student perspective. Um, access is an issue because of parking. So if you're a postdoc, you can move between campuses, but for me, Every now and then I have to go to the GES Center and it takes me like 40 minutes to an hour. Like I need to get to the bus on time and then the buses aren't always on time and then they have all these stops. And so do you have any power? Can you talk to, can you talk to the transportation office? To, because if, if I have to, if my main lab is here and I'm doing some of my projects here, but it takes me 40 minutes both ways, and that's two hours of my day, and I have classes to do, and I have to TA. Yep. Like, I've, I've heard that from I, faculty and students, and I know it's an issue. Okay. Uh, getting to Centennial Campus, I, I recognize it's an issue. My understanding is that they're, they're building a road that is more of a direct path from Centennial to main campus. Well, Poland now is going to go yeah. through, uh, you can see the cut in the road so there. It'll be faster. Uh, it may be a little faster, but then the parking issue, you know, you, there is a parking deck right next to the building, so that will be used, and we have parking spaces in front. That students yeah. can't use, though, yeah, because maybe. students yeah. will have a main campus parking So maybe that parking, you know, maybe uh, powers to be to get some of those spaces assigned. Cause if you could talk to the transportation <laughs> office and have a pass that's good for both. I would guarantee you... Uh, even if we had to pay like the university is charging me fifteen thousand dollars parking space. Oh really? Uh, so there will be some parking spaces available. But I, I, I would hammer that that if, if the model of interdisciplinarity requires people to move around between parts of campus, especially for yep. students, that's not an easy assumption. Like just like she said, I budget two hours for this one hour seminar because I have to get over here from Centennial and go yeah. the other way. I forget how many spaces I have to buy, but each space is fifteen thousand five hundred. It's in the plant science budget. I, I would just want to. I, I want to beat a dead horse and add. I dread going to Centennial Campus, and Lime Scooters have changed it a little bit. And I actually just pay five bucks round trip of my own money now because I get to control the schedule, and I like jumping off curbs on a scooter sometimes. <laughs> but like, uh, it's seventeen miles an hour. It's fun, um, but. That's not sustainable either. Uh, so even if you added one more bus, honestly, yeah, and like you just half circulated. the time you have to wait on the bus, that would probably cut the commute yeah, time in half because you would have this margin of error to build in. Yep. Um, and that's a lot cheaper for you. Yep. You don't have to cover that. Yep. No, that's a fair so, suggestion. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> Sorry, one more one more <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm also in the Ally program, and I'm on the advisor, alumni advisory board to the A2I. Good for you. And so I think I do see a lot of overlap here with the AgBioFuse, the, the new initiative, and then, then those. And the Accelerate to Industry, they're expanding their program right now too, and so I can't 
speak to what um, Zach was talking about with NGOs and government internships, but Accelerate to Industry, they're expanding this new internship thing too, so maybe you can partner with them, because it sounds like they're already getting that. Yeah, good to hear. I'm glad you together. participated in both of those. Yeah, Jen was in the program yeah, as well. Yeah, the H-Vive. H-Vive. I've heard great things. I, I was out of town when they did their final seminar last mm -hmm. spring or whatever. I, uh, we, we, I'm going to try to make those. Yeah. Yeah, I learned a lot. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, so, this is maybe a broader question than just a plant science issue right here around ethical decision making on the brazen state. What is the balance for ethical decision making in terms of, I mean, this seems really industry heavy, mm -hmm. which obviously then translates right to IP. And so, I'm curious what you're thinking is considering this is a public institution, a public university. And grant university. How much or any of the work that comes out of this is going to the public? Is that part of the discussion? You know, those are ongoing discussions today. I mean, there are there are ways to handle IP between joint projects, industry, and university today. And I can't speak, Fred probably knows more than I do, but the, you know, all that's kind of negotiated up front and everybody kind of knows the IP, who will we own it, will royalties or spin offs, et cetera, come out of that. So, a lot of that's in place today that I'm not up to speed on, but the, but that'll be part of it because we expect IP and products and things to come out of this, and who owns it is going to be a good question. Well, that, that brings up the other thing that you mentioned about the industry being head to head. Are there going to be industry people in the building doing research? Yes, we have. The building will have on floors three and floor three and four uh, areas carved out and call them partner space, that they can come in and rent whatever they need. They need a bench, wet bench, we'll, we'll redesign uh, it for them. If they just want an office in the, in the building for a set period of time, so they can interact with the researchers, they can rent an office space. And so there'll be two spaces carved out for partners, uh, yet to be defined what the rent is and how, but they will have, the goal there is so that uh, researchers can talk to researchers across Industry, academia, government boundaries. So we'll, we'll have a couple of areas carved out for partners. So to your point, uh, IP uh, protection of confidential. You know, companies are pretty protective of that. So we have to make sure all of that is kind of protected and defined in a contract, essentially. I'm thinking other that was a foot back here. Go ahead. No, meaning that like. I think the university, clearly public one, are focusing too much on protecting IP for businesses and not making them open, yep. specifically serving the public, particularly land grant institutions in agriculture. So I was just curious okay. what kind of conversation, if any, is that part yep. of this new um, building institute? Yep, and I would say the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship has, has those guidelines in place today. But I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that NC State and all land grant colleges yeah, yeah, are more and more, this, just... and more and more interested in IP as a way to justify their existence, right? So, I mean, you know, I, actually there was debate about how, you know, in the survey you sent out to the faculty in terms of how much should the ability of a project to generate IP be part of whether or not you get into the building. And there was a lot of know, differing opinions among the faculty, and a lot of faculty do not think that that should be one of the criteria for getting into the building, but I, I've been involved in this for a long time, and I see sort of like how strong that is with the university struggling for resources. IP is a major piece, so if we could pull something off like the next CRISPR and have that be... You know, I'm saying that, that, that this is when this is not a, a it's a major issue, yeah. and I too would love that for us to be generating stuff that's not uh, that is just in the public interest. But it's often hard to figure out what is in the public interest because if you talk to the people that were, you know, within that circle dealing with IP, they think that anything that we develop that doesn't have IP around it will be lost. So I, I don't know, probably Zach could speak much more eloquently about <laughs> these issues. 
Of course, I, I, certainly, I certainly think that they're, they're critical things. Well, even just, I mean, I don't know, I think people talk about UC Davis, what's the name of that? Is, like, PRI. Pyre. 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 Yeah. Like, uh, I haven't heard people talk about it recently, but that type of model of handling. And I do I do agree, I think it's good to be on PSI more up to university level like stuff, but it's also very important, um, especially if you're having contributors and you know, donors who are expecting to collect certain benefits from, from funding of well, I was just in a meeting with plant breeders, right? These are people doing conventional breeding. And their whole thing is, I mean, if you look at how much revenue the university gets from the seeds that the plant breeders have developed, so these are, these are not genetically engineered traits, but they're variety kinds of things, and that, the university looks at that, but how do you do that? I mean, even having some uniform policy up front about the university retaining that intellectual property and then licensing it out to companies. Yeah. That's just, I don't know, again, at the, the university level what the policies are, yeah. but it seems like you could have a specific, uh, even, you, you don't necessarily just have to defer to the university. You could have specific agreements in place for, you know, okay, if you're going to work in PSI space, then you have expectations about, about that arrangement of intellectual property. You'll have rights to license it, maybe for, you know, very cheaply, but we're going to retain the actual ownership of that right. So it's whatever you want to make it, really. If anyone's interested in looking more into this issue, I mean, this really came after 1980 when Congress passed the Main Bill Act, which determined, you know, that's really the law that set up the licensing and the technology transfer for nonprofit, uh, small businesses, so that they can also benefit from that IP. So if anyone's interested in that, so, so we're having this, these questions come from university employees right now. Did industry sort of ask you this up front before they signed the donor checks with some, you know, they, they had this understanding that they were signing up and wanted something out of the building and they've already put money down. Has any agreement already been made on, on that end? Yeah. They bring up these same questions. Money's collected thus far for the building. There was no, if I give you this, I expect that back. Um, although I will tell you, for instance, the uh, corn growers expect you know some good research to come out of this building that benefits the corn growers. Right. Same with the soybeans, same with cotton and tobacco, et cetera. So, you know, 44 of these organizations wrote a check, and. Uh, and that's good news. I said, mentioned the bad news. They're all going to want something. I think if you can produce a science that kind of crosses commodities, maybe it's a data analytics method that you can use in cotton and corn and soybeans that cuts across that. You can you can satisfy a lot of groups with some one discovery. It actually cuts across different parts of the supply chain and chain too, because actually corn growers would like nothing more than to have free, high quality, you know, non patented high quality seeds. Yep. They would be actually have an interest to not have. So there's some discussion. I know Dr. Lamo and I have had these discussions about, you know, public varieties instead of private varieties, and those royalties staying in the public arena and right. staying public. So a lot of discussions around varieties and variety protections. Yes. Um, so I'm interested in how you plan to implement a, a space where academic research happens and maybe industry comes in and rents lab space. Because there are very, you know, huge differences between how those types of labs are run. So I'm specifically thinking about GLP, GMP types of things that are required for industry, whereas academia, not so much. Um, is that something that is go? Is that something the individual inhabiting the space is going to have to deal with, or is there some sort of structure? We will have implemented to yeah. The building will have that. four or five what I'll call core labs uh -huh. with uh, top-notch equipment, whatever yeah. that lab is. Probably equipment that each individual faculty member or department couldn't afford, but maybe collectively can afford. And uh, we will have expert staff trained on that equipment. Mm -hmm. So you would, if you need that piece of equipment for the month of June, you would mm -hmm. sign up and we would, our staff would work with you on that. Same with industry. It's mm -hmm. maybe equipment from a startup company. They have zero cash to start, but they need access to certain specialized equipment they'd sign up for two weeks in May and share that. And it's kind of that open environment, shared environment. So that's how we envision that. On, on that topic, and also IP, and also Todd is here, 
Um, have you considered trying to stick a, a maker space or that type of uh, facility or equipment into one of your labs? Uh, because there are maker spaces on campus, none of them relate to biology. We've had those discussions, but I would say, no, we haven't carved out any of those spaces for energy PSI. Maybe to keep out curious in terms of when you mentioned startup companies, is that going to be an outreach you guys are doing to try to open up these facilities specifically for startup companies? Yeah, when we... Uh, out, out of the university? When, yeah, exactly. Uh, when we start finalizing what these partner labs will look like, I suspect we'll have more people want them than we have space. We only have about 4,500 square foot dedicated for partner space. So it's not like uh, we can have 10 companies each in there with 5,000 square feet each. We, we don't have that. Room. But yes, uh, new IP, new discovery, faculty member, uh, needs six months to try to refine something. Go for it. I knew this would happen. It's already right. 11 o'clock. I didn't even notice it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you again for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.